Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Karen Davidov, founder of the Jewelry Library, and I want to welcome you to our second installment of the Curriculum on Collecting, a multi-part project that will, over the course of a year, explore what it means to collect in the 21st century. So um, we are moderating our talks uh, with artists and sisters, Lucy and Emily Jockel. Each conversation will touch on jewelry as we do with the jewelry library, but we will also look at broader issues around collecting with various guests weighing in each time. Uh, tonight's conversation is about the artful transformation of objects in the context of collections, and there will be a lot to unpack, so get ready. Uh, along with Lucy and Emily, we have two wonderful guests joining us, New York City-based jeweler, Lauren Newton, and Oakland-based mixed media artist, Dimitri Broxton. As we're in webinar mode, we'd love to hear where you are Zooming in from in the chat. And if there's a question posed to our panel that you'd like to answer, feel free to join in the conversation also in the chat. But questions should be put in the Q&A on your panel, and we'll have time at the end to answer them. Now, after our first talk, we heard that people enjoyed getting to know Lucy and Emily through their visual bios. And so tonight, we've asked our panelists to introduce themselves that way as well. But I'm going to get started with a little mini bio of my own. So let me see. I can, okay, I'm gonna, um, um, gonna have to come back and try this one more time. Um, okay. Here we go. So I, like Lucy and Emily, I grew up in a family of collectors. And when I was about 10 years old, my parents got very deeply into Art Deco. And I loved reading their design books during the week um, and then going off with them to antique shows or flea markets um, on the weekends looking for things, looking for Art Deco things. So I um, I loved not only what I was learning from the books, but I also got into the covers, the graphics, the typefaces. And I started to look even, you know, back then as books, as objects. Karen, we can't see your slides. You can't see? Oh. Sorry about that. I don't know why. Let me just, hmm. I don't know what's, there's a little bit. Okay. Something has sort of happened with my images. Let's try this. Is that seen? Yes. Okay. Sorry, guys. So here are the books. I still have them. Um, and as I said, they were about objects and decorative arts, furniture, fashion, uh, even cocktails. So this is what um, I used to do when I was in my tween years. Um, at the same time, I had, I was starting my jewelry box collection and it started with a charm bracelet that my grandmother, it was a Mexican charm bracelet my grandmother had, she gave it to me. And then I started adding my own charms to it amassing charms for years that are still not um, attached to my charm bracelet, but still in my jewelry box. And I also had things that um, my grandmothers, both grandmothers had given me. I had cufflinks that were watches, rings that were watches, and my mom's sort of um, jewelry that she wore as a teenager. She gave me her orphan Annie decoder button that she sent away for with um, from cereal box. And I loved um, knowing the stories of these pieces. They were family stories, they were adventure stories, they were love stories. So um, I had the books and I had the jewelry. 
and I had the um, stories. But what I really loved was coming to New York and finding a community, a very rich and vibrant um, an energetic community of collectors and collecting. And um, these were people that uh, I had conversations with and there was, we'd show and tell, it was always called show and tell and share a lot of that. So that, this is sort of the origin story of the jewelry library um, that I am sharing tonight. So, but let's get our conversation started. Um, I'm going to turn the mic over to Emily Jockel and Lucy and stop my share. <laughs> Hello, I'm Emily Jockel. And I'm Lucy Jockel. Thank you all for joining us tonight for our second installment of a curriculum on collecting. So a little background for the series. Uh, Emily and I are sisters. She's an architect and ceramist, and I'm a professor and artist. And we recently had a joint exhibition, Sisterhood, Bodies in Proximity, at the Jewelry Library for New York City Jewelry Week 2021. And we felt like the conversations that came out of that exhibition deserved a bit of a deeper dive. Um, and so a curriculum on collecting came to be. If you'd like to get a more like a more in-depth introduction to Lucy and I's story, please watch the first panel discussion. I think we can drop that link in the bio. Um, you don't need to hear about us again. We'd now like to introduce our panelists. So I'd love it if you guys could hop on the video. Okay. Um, each of the panelists will give a short presentation before we begin the conversation to talk about their work and their history a bit. And Joe will drop, drop their contact info as well as ours in the chat. So first up, we have Lauren Newton. Hi. <laughs> Emily, do you want to read that by? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I thought Karen would uh, okay. figure the presentation. Okay. Let me do the bio, sorry. Um, Lauren Newton is an artist and jeweler living in Brooklyn, New York. As a child of Caribbean immigrants, exposure to nature was always an important part of her upbringing. Lauren spent her childhood roaming Prospect Park and the city's beaches. She is fascinated by how natural life transforms itself over and over again and is drawn to the weird and unusual the unseen and the taboo. Upon completion of a degree in wildlife science, Lauren pivoted to metalworking and founded her brand, Lauren Newton Jewelry, creating nature-inspired pieces. Recently, Lauren's work was featured in the New York Times as part of the jewelry edits collaboration with Radical Jewelry Makeover, transforming donated unwanted necklaces, earrings, bracelets, and brooches into jewelry. So thanks. And I <laughs> Thank you so much, Lauren, for sharing your work with us and joining yeah. us. Thank you for having me. Hi. OK, perfect. Um, this, I mean, kind of, this is one of my favorite pieces. It kind of sums up, kind of mashes the two worlds together of jewelry and how I've kind of always thought of myself. Um, I've always been interested in science. I've always been interested in nature. And this label, to me, always felt that other people thought it was negative. And I just kind of, um, as a word, embraced it. And I wear it kind of as a badge of honor, feeling like I know, I know lots of weird things and that's okay. And I feel like it's one of my favorite pieces to wear. Um, these pictures kind of sum up um, a bit of my background. The first one um, with the yellow snake, um, Fantasia, she's, long gone now, but um, she, I, when I worked at the Brooklyn Children's Museum as an educator and um, the right photo is when I worked at the Prospect Park Audubon Center also as an educator. So this was after my bachelor's degree of wildlife science. So I essentially was the person in the room with an animal and walking around, talking to people, talking to children, having them interact with the animal, touch the animal, having them learn weird facts and about the animal's life cycle. And um, it was something that I just really, really enjoyed sharing, um, sharing this information, making people feel as passionate about living creatures as I did. So this was a very like kind of poignant time of my life. And I, I miss the animals, I really do. 
Um, this is a picture of me and my dog Milo in a tree in Prospect Park, which is Prospect Park was kind of my stomping grounds when I was a little kid. I think we were there on a weekly basis with my mom and my dad and my siblings. And um, it's to this day, one of my favorite places to be. And um, the picture on the right encompasses kind of the reason why I started making jewelry. Um, I came back from a, my bachelor's degree in wildlife science and took a metals class and was instantly hooked on um, just the sense of wonder in essentially alchemy, just making something that didn't exist before out of gold or silver just really fascinated me and I became hooked. But in the making of products, I was like, all of my wildlife science background, all of my nature background, it's just like, there are so many weird, cool animals. Why aren't these animals tokens for people? Why aren't these animals um, like out in the world so people can see? So I was like, dodos are so cool. Does everybody know about dodos? They need to know about dodos. And so I created the dodo ring. It was one of my first pieces. And um, still is probably one of the only pieces you can find, Google it, with a dodo on it. So, and these are, a lot of these are my, um, my early pieces, definitely tokens, animal tokens. I feel like people really, um, often people gravitate towards a specific animal that they feel like they connect with in some way, that they feel like um, represents them in some way. And I feel like that about many animals, but um, I think that it allows people to kind of like pick and choose and um, feel like they're connecting to the jewelry and to things that they love. Um, these two photos are my personal collection, stuff I've collected over the years um, that, uh, that I wear on a semi-daily basis. Some of these things I've collected and some of these things are my own work, like the key with the diamond in the top of the left photo is my own work. And in the right photo, the, um, the Polaroid photograph is my own work. Those are my kids in the, in the Polaroid charm. I love to see things in miniature. Um, and I think that comes from kind of being a science nerd and see, kind of zooming in to the world and seeing how vast things are when you get, even when you get really, really small, like consider like a drop of pond water, how many things are in there zooming around that you don't see with the naked eye. But when you zoom in, you know, it's like a whole, whole other world. Uh, another, another two pieces of my collections, um, functional objects, knives, pencils, match cases, uh, objects with purpose, um, just being able to think about how people wear jewelry, why people wear jewelry, and um, sometimes even like as a woman, the necessity of it, if you don't have pockets, you know, maybe you need a pencil or a knife or places to hold your matches, a place to hold your matches if your dress doesn't have pockets. And the photo on the right, I'm sorry, bucket, thank you. The photo on the right um, is a collection. The, the ring all the way on the right is my own personal work. The other two are vintage of snakes. Um, I feel like my token animal is a snake and um, I own a snake personally as a pet. And um, I just really am drawn to them. I'm drawn to their transformation. I'm drawn to their um, misunderstoodness. Um, and I think that they're one of, they're very special animals. This is another one of my collections. Um, the second and fifth piece are my personal collections. Are, the second and third piece are my personal work and the rest are work I've collected from other designers. Bones and skulls are another theme that I really, really like. Um, still drawing back to nature and the idea of it being taboo to face mortality. And so I really think that, that it's been one of my common threads as well, something that I gravitate towards. Um, these two pieces are current work. Um, skulls, again, um, the one on the right under, set under an opal of four skulls. I just really like skulls as a motif. And um, it's something that I feel like my clients really gravitate towards. And this is some of my current work. I think you can see the very clear 
um, natural motifs. Um, the top, the top left square is uh, cast from stingray skin. The middle pair of earrings is cast from lychee skin, um, and the the square all the way on the right. These are claws that I've collected from Costa Rica, claws that came to me from Hawaii. So things that like essentially natural objects, something that would decay or decompose, reconstructed into a form that will last forever. Thank you. Yeah. I'm gonna, okay. Thanks guys. <laughs> Thank you, it's super beautiful. Thanks, Lauren. And thanks, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, oh. So next, next up we have Dimitri Broxton. So I'll give a little bio before he shares the slides. Um, so Dimitri Bro Broxton is a mixed media artist of Louisiana Creole and Filipino heritage, who was born and raised in Oakland, California. His textile sculptures reflect his connection to the sacred art of the Yoruba people of Nigeria, the beading traditions of the New Orleans M Mardi Gras Indians, and his love of hip hop and graffiti. Broxton holds a BFA with an emphasis in oil painting from UC Berkeley and an MA in museum studies from the San Francisco State University. His work has been exhibited internationally and most recently at SF MoMA Artist Gallery in 2019 and Untitled Art Fair, Art Fair in 2020. His work is held in several private collections in the permanent collection of the Manta Ray Art Museum and De Young Museum. He is represented by Patricia Suito Gallery in San Francisco, California. So welcome, Dimitri. Thank you so much for having me. This is exciting. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get started. All right. Um, so yeah, so for me, I'm just going to jump right in on this. For me, uh, I, I, I uh, studied oil painting. I'm obsessed with oil painting. Um, and you know, I was able to do that when I had my first child started to slow down when I had the second child. And then by the time the third child came along, it was just impossible because anyone who's done, done oil painting knows you need to have at least a minimum of three hours. Um, and it just wasn't something that I could continue to do <laughs> um, and be a present parent. Um, and, you know, I also couldn't have the kids with me when I was doing oil painting because it's toxic. Um, and so I turned to beads. Why? Because beads have this beautiful color that I loved and oil paint the sheen, um, but they also are essential materials for the two cultures that I come from on both sides of my family. Um, and so I wanted to have something that had this deep meaning um, for me, but also a material that, you know, I love how Lauren is talking about the spirit animals, but, but this material that has this deeper meaning that you can't quite put words to. Um, and so kind of my first foray, foray was into jewelry making. So I spent a couple of years making jewelry, you know, selling at jewelry fairs and um, at bead shops um, where I, I, for me, it was this really meditative process um, of taking these tiny little grains of glass and weaving them together to make something beautiful um, that had some meaning to me and also the wearer. Um, I also experimented a little bit with some off loom beading. Um, you know, I think this one is brick stitch for any of those folks out there who are into stitching. Um, and then it dawned on me, you know, at this point of like, I went to school to be an artist. Um, jewelry is, is awesome, but it's not really necessarily my path. Um, how can I take what I love about the jewelry and specifically beadwork, which is not which is not always treated as a high form of jewelry making, right? Um, and so, you know, what what is something that has significance to me? Um, I look towards my grandfather, who was in um, the U.S. Army and had boxed um, around the world, and you know, I was thinking I was going to get into boxing. 
never did it, but I had this pair of gloves. So I started sewing directly onto um, the boxing gloves. And, and this kind of is where I started to find my language. Um, I started to take some of my inspirations from jewelry making, um, you know, the, the multiplicity for talking about collections, the collections of cowrie shells that have these deeper meanings for me in addition to the beads, but then also um, adding things like quartz crystals or onyx that had, um, yes, my slides are, are changing. Are they not changing for you? Yeah, they're not changing for us. Oh, shoot. Um, I must be flipping, I must be showing the wrong screen. Thank you so much for whoever that is that told me that. How do I switch my screen? Shoot. Oh no. Okay. Well, I guess you're just seeing this. I don't know why it's not showing. It's not actually playing. Slideshow. Okay. So how about I just do this? Let me go back. Um, can you see this? Yes. I don't know what happened. What was happening with me? Yes. Okay. No. Sorry. Yeah. I have no idea why it is not technolo technology. Okay. So <laughs> let so let's go back. Oh, thank you so much for saying that in the chat. <laughs> So here's here's the here's the work uh, that I was talking about um, going into um, you know the boxing gloves and that's a picture of my grandfather but you know um, including other materials such as the quartz crystals also onyx points I go to bead shows um, places where usually jewelry makers go to get their materials um, to source my things and so it's really bringing all that together for me I've sewn on other things that are connected to to boxing. Um, so this is a, you know an Everlast boxing robe, but elevating it using a little bit of inspiration from um, the world of costuming, um, but also the sacred art of the Yoruba people, um, and and bringing that to get and bringing that together in the work. Um, I also like to work on found objects. Um, so the American flag has a lot of meaning for me um, and for a lot of folks, um, whether that flag has the traditional red, white, and blue colors, or it is black and white has different meaning um, for folks. And so again, I'm bringing together different materials that are rich with meaning um, that have meaning for me, but may have a totally different uh, set of meanings for the audience members, the, the, those who are viewing it. Um, Sometimes I'm just playing off with the piece on the left, worth the weight, playing off uh, just the material of the cowrie shell, um, which also, you know, doubled as money. It's sometimes used in adornment, um, but also was used in currency to trade in human bodies. So though my work is beautiful and, 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 and definitely inspired by jewelry, you know, there, there's deeper histories that I'm um, talking to, I sometimes get into other materials that I find really amazing, like nails, and then I get deeply nerding out about the history of nails in America and manufacturing of them. Yeah, I, I go like really deep on that kind of stuff. Um, here's the picture. This is the piece that's in the Monterey Muse uh, Museum of Art, which is really amazing to me. I went to high school there. I grew up in Oakland and still live here, but I spent my high school years in Monterey. So it's really nice that a piece is, you know, permanently housed in a place where uh, that has a lot of significance to me. Um, I've got a couple of videos. You can't see them right now for some reason of just my process of weaving. We can talk about that, um, but it is embroidery, um, but using beads. And I use a two bead backstitch. So two beads at a time um, to make the work. And then going back to the jewelry where I was really inspired by um, off loom weaving um, techniques, I started to just blow that up by using larger and larger um, beads. You can't tell the scale of this, but this is six feet by six feet. Um, and that is it. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry that the slideshow is not working properly. Thanks, Dimitri. Thanks. I'm about to, have to see the photos, though. <laughs> so that was great. Thank you. Okay. So let's jump in. <laughs> So I feel like we should go right to the center and just meditate on one point from those intros. Um, there were things in each of your presentations and in your artwork that show up again and again. Um, Lauren, we were seeing a series of special charms and skulls and things that were reminding um, you of 
us of mortality. Um, many versions of Fantasia the snake, <laughs> which is amazing. And Dimitri nails and cowrie shells and the boxing gloves. Really cool to see your grandfather and the beads. And all of these um, are signified fires and they're super loaded. And I think we talked about this a bit the other day together where collections can be interpreted in so many ways as physical objects, which we just saw a lot of, but also as things you notice and you keep in your mind um, out of all of the possible things. So what are the common threads that inform your collections? If you could really distill it down, why these objects and not other objects? What's that common curiosity? Um, I'll start. I think for me, it's all the thread has always been something that ties back to nature or to life in some form or to um, um, sp specifically even with the snakes and the skulls. I think that um, it ties back to what I learned in my wildlife degree about bones and about um, decomposition and about evolution. And I think that those two, especially bones and snakes, have kind of like threaded their way through my work and just through my life in general. I think I've always been um, not afraid of snakes and I've always been, um, when we as a species are programmed, genetically programmed to be afraid. And so I feel like I've always, I'm a Slytherin if anybody cares. Um, <laughs> any, um, so it's just like, I've always not been afraid. And as an educator, um, when I walk out with a giant bow constrictor, before I walk out, I always told the parents, I'm like, children learn to be afraid. They learn to be afraid. They're taught to be afraid. And so when I walk out and the parents gasp, the children look to the parents and be like, okay, how am I supposed to react to this animal? But when I come out and they learn and they touch and they understand, um, it becomes less scary. It becomes less threatening. And I think it's one of those things that I, I prided, I prided, I, um, <laughs> I was proud of about being able to educate people in that way to take away a little bit of that fear. And I think maybe for the skulls, it's the same thing. You know, people, I feel like sometimes people feel very off put by a skull. Like it's a certain genre of music or a certain genre of, of t-shirts or a certain type of person wears a skull. And I think that I've kind of tried to break that open a little bit in the sense that it's just like, it reminds people, it reminds people of what's underneath. It reminds people that what's left when everything falls away. And I think that just being able to be, be proud of that and wear it as an emblem of the fact that, that you know that mortality is real and you know that life is short and you know that those things are coming. I think just trying to soften that blow a little bit. That's great. And I mean, I think what you said about um, mortality, facing mortality being taboo, I love that you're taking your position as an educator and training like really strongly channeling that into your work. It's so evident and really exciting. Thanks. Dimitri. Yeah, I think yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think I think for me the the items that or the objects that I'm the most attracted to um, have this ancestral connection and this deep memory. Um, you know, and oftentimes for me it's it's you know I'm really attracted to something and I become obsessed with it. It's so much that I start. I, I guess I do start collecting them, right, um, with the intention of using them in some kind of way, but inevitably like we all do, I end up, you know, with things that never actually make it into their work um, at some point. But for me, it's it's really, um, as I sit with the materials, like, you know, going back to the cowrie shell, um, you know, it, it was something that, you know, family members would wear as jewelry. They'd wear, you know, the women in my family would wear it and wear them in their hair. Um, I'd see them, you know, going to the, here we have a big flea market, <laughs> um, the Ashby flea market where all the, um, you know, the hippies and the woo woo people, <laughs> and the, 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 the very spiritual people, you know, go out and, and sell their goods. And so it was something that I would see my whole life. And 
just be really attracted to this beautiful little thing. But then as I started to decode and learn the history of it, particularly through um, Saida Hartman's uh, book, To Lose Your Mother, um, you know, where she decodes the history of just the singular object, where it comes from, why it found its way into Africa and pretty much in every indigenous culture, um, in the world and you know what what this thing really really means where it comes from and so then i started to get obsessed with that another thing that i collect that i did not talk about in my slide presentation is the lyrics so every single one of my pieces is covered in lyrics from songs that i also you know i guess i do collect those in playlists right and then um certain you know, verses will just be stuck in my head. And I and you know, then I start to think like, oh, these all have double meanings. It's not just, you know, someone saying, you know, I'm worth the weight. Um, it, it, it's, it's saying something much different. And then I start to play with the language of like, is it I'm waiting for something or is it the weight, like how heavy something is? Mm. Um, I think that's what else needs your playlist. <laughs> <laughs> I have too many playlists, too many. <laughs> you're doing such a service too to the to the finished product or finished piece when you're diving so deeply into the history of those of just one material that you're using and just fully understanding that. Um, and I wonder, this is kind of another um, kind of like a heavy question, I guess. But what does it mean to use these? materials now and to kind of recontextualize them with this history that they have. Um, Lauren, do you want to jump into that one or? <laughs> um, uh, I think I said in my in my intro specifically about taking objects that I find important or important for look, for feel, for message and um, transforming them into something that would that would literally transforming them from something that would literally decompose into something that now lasts forever i mean gold will not decompose silver will not it will last forever so taking a crab claw and and casting it and making a bracelet out of it and that will last forever while the crab claw will not and so kind of immortalizing these um these objects i think has kind of been my way it's just like this in metal, I'm always like, when I find something, I'm like, this in metal would be so cool. Most like transforming, like alchemist transforming. And I think that that's, it's, it's one of the loves of, of what I do. Yeah, I think, I think, I think for me, it's just very much, I, I do have a sensibility, you know, to jewelry because right, right. All jewelry is beautiful. Like even if you're trying to not make it beautiful, even just the material that it's made of, you know, is gorgeous. So if you're putting a dark motif together and it's diamonds and gold, like right, it's just gorgeous inherently. Um, and so for me, I think I really prescribe to. There's an artist from Jamaica, um, Ebony G. Patterson. I think she's in New York now, actually, um, who makes these beautiful works that all have these dark stories behind them um, once you start to get behind them. And so I really um, subscribe to, to her philosophy of making um, work that's so beautiful that it seduces you in, but then at once you're in, then I hook you with like, okay, now there's something deep that we need to talk about that, you know, if I just slapped it, you know, slapped you in the face with this deep, dark history of, you know, Cowrie Shells' blood money, um, you know, a large majority of people wouldn't run the other way. You know, they're they're not interested in having to confront that history. But when you see something that's beautiful, that's sparkly, that's shiny, um, that is amassed with so many of them, that it becomes something. I, I love how you said alchemy. That that is transformed into something completely different. Um, then people start to ask questions. You know, it's like, well, why are you using so many of those? Like, why are you? <laughs> using you know 20 pounds of nails <laughs> like you know couldn't you just do a couple of them like what are you trying to say by having so many of them then we can start to have the dialogue and i feel like it's it's that's that's where jewelry becomes art i feel like that's that's the flip because i feel like not all jewelry is art and yeah, i say yeah, that true. i say that confidently not all jewelry is art <laughs> Um, because I've seen jewelry that is not art, but 
So that being said, I think that's where that's where the switches flip. It's it's not just an object; it's a story, and I think mm. that's when it becomes something that somebody sees it on you and they're like, um, I'll, "I'll tell a story of a piece that I um, that I don't wear anymore, um, but I used to wear a lot, and it was a pistol. It was about this big, and it had wings on it, and I wore it often, and I would get compliments on it or like, why, what is that? Tell me about that. And I was like, fight or flight. It's, it's the mm. basic human nature of we either confront something or we run away. And it was cute. It was adorable. I don't wear it so much anymore because guns, but like it, it's the story that makes it art and what makes people drawn to it and want to collect it. And I think that's, that's, it's wonderful the way you put it, like the, the conversation, the story. Yeah. That's awesome. I, you know, I loved, you know, when, when Lauren, you were talking about not being afraid of snakes, but it's our instinct to, you know, we are, we learn, we learn um, to be afraid. And I thought, I think about that in art, you know, sometimes, you know, you just have to, it has to be in your face a little before you can kind of, res you know, that, that it creates a response. And um, and maybe that isn't two or three nails, but it's the ton of nails or, um, I, you know, I love just these ideas about decomposition that you were talking about, but it's, it's the, you know, how do we invite people in to have that conversation? Cause it, it is important. And, um, and sometimes this sort of excessiveness isn't, is necessary to kind of draw them in. And I think one of our, um, someone made a comment about the skull image becoming normal. Absolutely. It's because people kept making things with skulls on them and it didn't, it wasn't scary to people anymore. And it wasn't morbid to people anymore because, you know, in Victorian times, it was absolutely as morbid as you can get. It's like, there's a skull on something because somebody died and that's mm -hmm. the way it was. But it's not like that anymore because people kept saying skulls are cool. Skulls are interesting. They're the bones in your face. Let's look at them. And that's how it became more acceptable, so to speak. So speaking about that piece that you showed with the skulls, it was interesting to me that you had you had your own work beside the collected pieces, yes. that one charm bracelet. So what came first? Did your work come or were you inspired by what you collected? Oh, that's a good question. I think it was like a bits and pieces because I've always, and a couple of, there's two jewelers in there that I admire tremendously. And um, I admired their skulls. I, and admired, I admired their interpretation of a skull. And I was just like, okay, I want to make my own version of what I think I would want to wear every day, what reminds me of my mortality. And uh, it just became the, uh, the cutest collection because it, it's, there's different materials in there, there's different sizes, there's different interpretations, and I just love it so much. Yeah, and I, yeah, and I think, sorry, Liz. No, go ahead. <laughs> um, what you were saying about, um, you know, the everyone having an innate fear of snakes, there is, it almost doesn't matter if those pieces came before yours or your piece came first, because maybe inside all of us is this natural tendency to gravitate toward that sort of archetypal symbol um, as, and you've you know, you've turned it into a sort of talisman or a yes. token yes. Um, yes. through your attraction to it. Right. And I think about things like, in addition to not just skulls, but, you know, some, some jewelers cast bones and, and things of that nature. And I love stuff along the same lines, because it's just like, you think about mortality, because the only time you see bones is when something is, is dead. So it's just like, it's the only time you would ever come into contact with a bone of something is if a person or an animal was no longer there. And so it's like a direct, like kind of like a very direct result of, of perishing essentially. Yeah. Uh, Lucy had a question that I'm gonna trigger, which is um, maybe you could tell us a specific story, a story behind a specific object in your collection so that we could like in your work um, made of collections, I suppose, so that we could really get in and understand uh, the nitty gritty, like you are, Dimitri, you're speaking about the nails and how you could really like get in there 
where the cowrie shells are such an intense symbol and have so much meaning? Uh, I could tell you a little, about, a little bit about the claws and the lychee and the stingray. And that collection is called the armor collection. And I approached it mm -hmm. in a way that was kind of like natural material, natural objects, plants, animals that, well, um, crabs and lobsters have exoskeletons. So they're soft on the inside and hard on the outside to protect themselves from predators, et cetera. Um, stingrays, they have this very, very soft, very, very hard um, bony skin as well, like sharks. And um, lychee is a very soft fruit on the inside, but the skin is very spiky and hard. And I approached it feeling like, okay, these are natural um, barriers to the world. These are natural um, defenses to the outside world. And so that was kind of like the common thread of that collection. Yeah, I think for me recently, so I am totally obsessed with cowrie shells of all kinds. Um, and so I will show you one real quickly if I can lift it. So, <laughs> um, so this is the most recent piece that I'm attempting to work on. Um, and these are chocolate cowrie shells or um, humpback cowrie shells. Yeah, the piece is bigger than my head. Um, and so they're made up of these I do, I do collect these of these just really gigantic, almost the size of a hand, uh, cowrie shells. Um, and, and for me, you know, these are these special objects. So, you know, I started off with the standard white cowrie shells that are in jewelry. And I guess there's a reason because these are huge then, and heavy that no one uses them for jewelry. But, um, you know, for me, they're, they're, they're this object that bridges the cultures that, that I'm, you know, descended from. Um, so my grandmother's from the Philippines um, and the rest of my ancestry is from West Africa um, by way of the transatlantic slave trade, um, or actually they came before that, um, actually. And this is one of the only cowrie shells that is found in both places, in the Philippines wow. as well as wow. the East side of Africa did not come through trade. Um, people could find it. And so just going into that history and of the singular, you know, beautiful little object and, um, you know, finding that connection that it's like, okay, well, this is the cowrie shell that represents me and my ancestry. Wow. I want to talk, tie back and forward actually, because he's talking about shells. And I want to talk about one of my pieces in the armor collection that actually features a shell. Woo um, yeah, so this this earring is actually, I'll show it to you. You can see it. Pretty, it's gorgeous. Um, and it is cast from a tusk shell. And um, um, tusk nice. shells are from um, this very, very small, tiny mollusk that lives inside the tube of the shell and uh, is another living creature, plant, animal, fruit, soft on the inside, hard on the outside to protect themselves from predators. So yeah, shells and shells. And that's that's one of those that, you know, I have a lot of, uh, cause I'm, I'm deeply into the bead community. And then I'm particularly like into connecting with male presenting um, bead workers. Cause I think we're so rare. Um, and you know, that those dentalian shells, I think is what they're called or, mm -hmm. or, or something that a lot of the Plains Native Americans use mm -hmm. through their costuming. And yeah, I just recently discovered that cause I have nerded out about shells <laughs> right. Um, right. And, and, the, and their use in things and jewelry and adornment um, and costuming and, and then also ceremony. So I don't know if and you as, connected as to currency. that. And, and, and for you currency. like as currency, yeah, yeah for sure, for sure. Yeah. Um, oh, this is a good question. I see it from, from Barbara here. Um, I have had at least a dozen conversations about jewelry and art and art and jewelry and <laughs> have felt like such a snob for so many years. And um, because uh, I am a fine jeweler now. And so I, I create things out of fine jewelry, fine jewelry, 18 karat gold and things like this. And so I've all, I was always like, Oh, art jewelry. Uh, uh, uh. And so it, it was to me, for me and my, and my um, definition, I create jewelry art. So it's jewelry first and um, it's wearable first and art as like the story comes out 
by just the, the action of me making it. So, but it's always wearable. It's always wearable in a way that's not like a brooch that weighs 25 pounds, if that makes sense. So, and I think sometimes art jewelry is art first and wearable second. And I think that becomes a little bit fuzzy to me because it's like, well, if it's not wearable, like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like uh, practically wearable. If it's not practically wearable, then is it jewelry? And so it's, <laughs> it's, it's and, and this is something that I've dealt with for so long. Cause I'm just like, oh, it's jewelry first. And then our, and the reason why I say jewelry first is because human beings have, human beings started wearing jewelry before we started wearing clothes. So we started adornment and it, and the, the nature of it had to be wearable. It had to be wearable on the neck, on the ear, on the fingers. And so for me, it's jewelry first and by way of the making becomes art. Mm. I get that. I mean, I think, I think there's also the deeper meanings that get attached to, to the items, right? Um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think the same thing, like so many of the things that I, I feel like I create, you know, it's it's like, why is it art? You know, it's because of the meaning that's 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 behind it. Otherwise, it's, it could be just decorative and, and no offense to folks that make decorative <laughs> objects either, right? Um, but I think I think it's it's having the meaning. And I think also, you know, I have a lot of friends that are art jewelers as well. And sometimes it's not wearable and it's really cool and makes a statement and looks great in a gallery. But sometimes, yes. you know, it's, it's yes. like that that balance of something that's really wearable, that's practically wearable on a daily basis that that won't cut you or <laughs> <laughs> or make your break your neck or whatever to wear it. Um, that has these deeper meanings. And I think I think something that wasn't meant to be art could have that with it, but but I don't think I, I think it's that intention of the maker that's that's imbuing these these um, these different meanings and these reasonings behind why why you're doing what you're doing that makes it just a little extra special. And right. I also sound like a snob when I say that, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I'll own it. Yeah, I get it. I totally get it. Well, Dimitri, would you consider do you consider wearability at all because you're using boxing mitts and kind of garments, or do you consider adornment kind of more of an act like you're adorning these things that were once wearable? Yeah, I mean, I think at this point, yeah, I, I have, that's something that I wrestle with is definitely, I, I mean, like this piece right here. I mean, you'd have to be super duper strong to even wear that. And, and you're not, even if you're, you know, <laughs> He-Man or whatever, you're not gonna be able to do that <laughs> for too long, right? Because because the piece is like 30 pounds. And so I have been I have been thinking about, you know, switching. I, I need to learn engineering. I, I keep on working with fabrics and things like that. And I don't know how to engineer them to sustain use um, or or wear, but I'm very much interested in um, you know, incorporating performance in the work. Mm -hmm. Um and activating them through dancers, through um, you know models who are who are photographed um, wearing them, and so that's something that I'm thinking about long term. Um, but right now, no, they're not. They're just they're strictly. I'm thinking about things that are going to hang on a wall, sit on a pedestal <laughs> um, at, at at this point in a gallery or a museum. Um, but yeah, I am eventually thinking about that practical like how, how do I how do I move this into something that's um that's wearable and not even I don't even know if I'll ever get to the place where they're practical they're like jewelry where you can wear them daily <laughs> yeah Dimitri what I immediately thought about when you were thinking about taking your your art into performance was the sound yeah yeah like that's immediately what I thought about I think of like the African the shikare the um gourd with the the, the cowrie shells on the outside of it mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. that's immediately what I thought about like just the sound it just sounds like ancestry does that make sense yeah yeah like and how amazing completely. that would be just for people to to hear that in a space you know in addition to the art it just that immediately came to me mm -hmm. oh, I love that I love thinking towards that and for the future <laughs> <laughs> 
I think what you guys are talking about is a lot of um, like how to transform uh, these raw materials into something that is bigger than, that are bigger than themselves. Um, how to, how you turn cowrie shells into the sound of ancestry. And I, Dimitri, you, I was looking at one of your recent Instagram posts where you said you spent, you know, X hours cutting cowries and I had to like think a minute to understand what you mean. And then I could see that you were trans, you were cutting them in order to transform them in, into your work. And that is such a meditation and you're pouring so much care into that act of, of raising these raw materials up to a place where they can be, you know, technically turned into a work of art. There's, that's, yeah, <laughs> so much care there. In that yeah, and I love I, I love what Lauren said about it being that that being part of the alchemy, right? Um, I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna keep roll, rolling with that, Lauren, because yeah. I love it so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that through the act of making it becomes art. The action yes. of me making it is what you said that it becomes art through that action. Yeah. Which is like very well said. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I think we have some questions. Somebody says, "What's." Mm on the horizon. Um, I am pretty low key right now. I have two small children. So I'm, and I work full time uh, doing production for a, another designer. So, but I think as, as it starts to get cooler again and I start to kind of hole up in my studio, maybe I'll start tinkering a little bit more and getting some more pieces out there. I am looking forward to doing more one of a kind um special out into the world type of pieces um i see tina says our mother says uh, dimitri i recently <laughs> purchased a box full, of, box full of vintage clothing and i traced it back to the aka peoples of thailand it reminds me of your work vests and hats adorned with shells metals etc and Martha asks, what do you do when your materials aren't inspiring you? How do you renew your inspiration? Oof. That's, that's a tough one. Um, I think that if, 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 I had, if I had the time, um, I think being outside, um, being outside, being in nature, digging in the dirt, um, looking at twigs and looking at, I, there's a, <laughs> Oddly enough, there's an Instagram page that I follow. I can't remember it right now. And she does like microscopic views of pond water. It's such a nerd <clears throat> thing to look at, but it is, it's like confetti. It's amazing. And I feel like that takes me back to, um, to my fervor for um, tiny things and my fervor for, nat for, um, for nature and wildlife. And um, odd story, when I was in college, I did... Uh, like a uh, ink drawing of a paramecium. It's about this big. And then years ago, I posted it to Instagram that I had found it after 13 years. And someone contacted someone contacted me, and, and they were like, "Can I use this as a tattoo?" And I'm like, "Sure." And she sent me the photo. She had this giant paramecium tattooed onto her <laughs> leg, and I was like, "This is it. This I arrived. <laughs> this is you know, like this is what it's about. You know, transforming." things and 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 sharing them with people in a way that that it is special to them as well yeah I think I think I think for me it's like I don't perceive myself ever getting tired of my materials when I was a painter I would just get obsessed with tubes of paint right and just finding the various <laughs> colors of red like I, I, I love red and so just I'm getting feedback um, <laughs> Um, so yeah, so, so I think for me, you know, with the materials that I, that I use, which is the, the glass beads, like there's so many variations of the color. Um, there's also so many different textures. For me, I also plan to learn to make my own beads. I haven't done that yet. Um, so that, I think that will add another layer to it. I don't know what the feedback is happening. <laughs> um, and yeah, so, so I've been also taking other classes. So um, I've, I've been printmaking recently and then doing this, this thing that I haven't seen printmakers do where then I start to sew beads and other objects onto it. So then that's another way of adding a layer 
to the work, but then also like what we we're talking about, I want to take the work and transform it. So I think for me, it's always giving myself a problem. Um, mm. As soon as I get tired, it's like, well, you know, there's uh, like Tina was saying, you know, th there's there's so many cultures that use the materials that I do and they use it in different ways. So researching that and then getting inspired to kind of switch up um, what I do. So I hope this is something that I do for the rest of my life. Um, I'm only in my 40s now and I hope I live. <laughs> I'm, I hope I'm at least only halfway there. So. <laughs> I heard that the oldest man is 118, so. Nice. Oh my gosh. I don't know if I want to live that long. I've seen his pictures and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm good. <laughs> um, for Dimitri, you gestured to your right to a project. Can we see it? Oh, um, I think, yeah. I mean, I just have a few pieces that are sitting next to me. Um, again, how I, how I challenge myself is these are all beads. <laughs> so, wow. so just working, working extra, extra large. I think you guys are seeing some things that I don't think I've shown the rest of the world. I don't think anyone has seen any of these. Um, wow. also just switching the shells that I'm working on, working with, you can see the dimension of it. Um, so just. Wow. I don't know. I don't know. It's also it's it's also just you know going from these like little microscopic um, beads that are uh, like size eleven. Uh, I um, for anybody that knows that it means it, it takes eleven of them strung together to make an inch, um, wow. and then like switching from that to these huge huge shells on the other on the other hand that require a completely different material to sew with. So so my giant needle as opposed to the like really, really tiny beading needles. So for me, it's, it's like always switching and, and changing up the challenge. How, how about you, um, Lauren, what do you do? Um, I feel like, um, let me think. I mean, I do a lot of casting um, of natural materials. Uh, I use a lot of stones. Um, I think that I, and now thinking about new work, I'm like, how can I create something that looks like water? How can I create something that looks like fish in water or a jellyfish? Or a... So I feel like, like you said, it's like common problems of trying to, oh, this is a perfect segue. So I was telling Karen that before the, I did the pieces for the jewelry makeup, the, the radical jewelry makeover with the jewelry edit, I, as a jeweler, put myself in this 18 karat gold box. I was like, I'm a fine jeweler. That's what I do. I make prongs. I make bezels. I use diamonds. That's what I do. And so in being asked to do, do the radical jewelry makeover project, I was um, forced to break out of that box and use different materials, use a resin and use pearls and use wire and use all these different things that I had never used before in jewelry paint. I've never painted anything in jewelry before as, as, been, as being used in a jewelry medium. And it stretched me in a way that was like transformative, it was transformative. And um, I told Karen, I was just like, in some way, some, somehow on the path to becoming a jeweler, I forgot that I was an artist. And these pieces mm -hmm. that came forth from this, this um, the Radical Jewelry Makeover were just transformative to me. As, as a person, just as a person. So it's like, I forgot that I created things that were not 18 karat, you know, and I, and I could. So, yeah. This I don't know if anybody has those pictures. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if anybody has the, the radical jewelry makeover pictures. I could talk about them a little bit if we have time. I think we have a moment or two. Okay. Lucy, I'll pull them up and then I, we've got one question in the Q and A, okay. which will be our last question after this. Oh, this is gorgeous. <sighs> Thanks. Well, so yeah, so yeah. this piece um, was created with uh, green glass stones from a brooch. I think it was probably from the sixties or seventies, and I hand carved the back of the green glass stones. And the major part of the cuff was a brass, just a blank brass cuff. So I drilled through it and created all these prongs to hold the glass stones, which are leaves. And then I handmade, I handmade the little ants 
and the, the backs of their abdomens have are pearls and created this whole thing in and none of it i think some of it is silver but none of it is gold it's brass it's glass it's everything that somebody essentially threw away and i transformed it into this this piece that has now been sold right hey. yeah let's do the brooch next This brooch, um, which Karen owns, um, is called um, Trapped in a Bygone Era. And it, it's a classic cameo shape, classic cameo color. And it came to me without a pin on the back, without anything on it, except like a really ugly uh, rose motif. And I scratched the rose motif off and hand painted this um, Venus flytrap motif because I thought it needed to have a botanical motif but this is the one that people don't think about. This is the one, this carnivorous plant, this man eater and um, the idea that, that people's ideas get, get trapped in the past. And um, that's that piece that I created. And the last one, um, which is my favorite, um, is called uh, Only Brush the Ones You Wanna Keep. And it's made with a plain brass cuff. Um, it's made with wire and a string of freshwater pearls and one 18 karat gold tooth. And I hand, in, I hand resined the back in a bright pink to simulate gums. And it's just like, it's my absolute favorite. It's funny and it's weird and it's creepy at the same time. And it just really speaks to me about in the same way bones do. And the fact that like, you don't really see teeth like this unless somebody's dead. And they're kind of goofy and funky. And so this one's my favorite. And this one also sold. A real tooth. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it one of your children's teeth? Or? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, no, I just, I hand, I hand forged it from 18 karat gold. Beautiful. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great transition to this next question. Oh. How do your young children inform your work and how do you share your work with them since you utilize these wonderful materials, shapes, and histories? Ooh, that's interesting. Yeah, I think, I think for me, again, like going from the paint, um, and one of the things that I didn't say uh, also <laughs> is that where I work is the couch. Um, and so my kids are sitting next to me. They're in the same room with me. Um, they're watching me <laughs> all the time. I have two sons and a daughter. The daughter is... Um, the middle child and she is the most artistically uh, talented or, or inclined of my children. Um, the other, the boys don't really care about art. They just see me do it. They get dragged to the shows, <laughs> you know, they're like, oh, you're, you're doing this thing. I think for them, they, th they probably think it's just a hobby <laughs> or something. Whereas like she really tru truly understands, um, you know, that I'm saying something deeper. And so my kids, we, we have conversations about them, you know, the materials that I'm using, the stories that I'm referencing, the histories that, that, um, that I'm also referring to with the pieces, um, but I'm not beating them over the head with it, right? Because they'll, they'll come to it in their own time if they choose to or not. Um, but I think for me, it's, the, it's this really interesting thing about being a parent and showing my kids that that I can, you know, in addition to my day job, I can also do this other thing that also pays the bills. Like, you know, I just helped to pay my oldest son's uh, college. I have a 19 year old who's almost 20. Um, wow. And I was not a teen parent, just saying that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but um, you know, I helped to I helped to pay one of his uh, college bills with this. So so for, for me to for the kids to see like, OK, this is something that I'm passionate about. I love doing it. You see me spending all these hours working until two and three in the morning. But then it translates into something in the real world. Um, you know, I, I think for me, that's the most important part. And then, and then, you know, I was, my parents hated that I went to art school. Um, you know, they thought I was going to be, you know, in my forties living in their basement still. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I think for me, the, the most important part of, about being a working artist and parent is showing my kids that there are alternatives to being a doctor or a lawyer. If you want to be that, you know, go for it, but you know, there's other ways to make livings um, that you don't see on television or people don't talk about or, or uplift, um, that you could also find your own path doing. 
Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, my children are very young. Um, my, can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, my older son is three and my younger son is 15 months. So they are very little. And um, my job is not one I can do with them around. If there's heavy things involved and dust and drills and things like that. And my, my two children are both boys. So being a mother of two boys and being a jeweler, I'm like, what's gonna happen to all the jewels? But it's okay, it's okay. They'll wear them, all of them at once, hopefully, and it'll be great. But I think that what I, for them right now, it's the charms. It's what I'm wearing around my neck that somebody's always fiddling with. It's the things that when they grow up, they will remember about me something that that was worn close to my skin or something that I wore all the time. These are the, the core memories that are, that are, um, that are formed, but also um, them knowing as that as a parent, they had a parent that pursued something that they are absolutely consumed with and absolutely love and knowing that that to be able to do that is possible. And knowing that, yes, I'm absolutely their mother, but I'm also this other person, this artist, this woman, knowing that those two things are separate. For me, raising men is really, really important to be kind of that strong figure and be like, okay, my mom loves me and she takes care of me, but she also loves her job. And she also loves making art and jewelry and has this dichotomy of things that are both okay and both really valuable. Awesome. I, I think your children, you know, I think they absorb it anyway, like Dimitri, those, I, 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 I'm I, sure even though they may not show it now that your sons are taking it all in, I think we all do. I think, you know, as this, you know, we talk, we grew up in families, um, Lucy, Emily, and I, of collectors, and, and it's sort of, it's in our DNA, um, and people that made things and people that appreciated, you know, the material world. So I, I know, I know, I think the three of us at least are an example of how children absorb things, even when you don't think they are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I won't be upset if my, you know, if my, either of my sons picks up a mandrel or a mallet or a saw blade, I will be okay with that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I, it, time goes really quickly yeah. <laughs> having fun. And it's such a, a great, incredible conversation that we know could go on and on. Um, but we're sort of over the hour. I hope um, that, I, you know, I hope that we can continue it another time. But thank you, Lauren and Dimitri for such, you know, great, things to think about tonight and Emily and Lucy as usual for wonderful questions and thoughtful um, responses. Um, we, I, I wanna mention a couple of things. Um, uh, we're gonna have this talk uh, on YouTube after the fourth, we'll, we'll get it up and it's gonna be on our YouTube channel, the Jewelry Library, but I will send it out. Um, and then, Lucy is giving a talk this Wednesday, June 29th at the Baltimore Jewelry Center at 6 p.m. and in person and also online um, for the closing reception of the Transforming the Prototype exhibition where participants were given a vintage wax pattern and asked to radically transform the prototype into bespoke jewelry or objects. Ooh, um, the cool. link is in the chat. Um, so if you want to join that at Baltimore Jewelry Center, which is an amazing place, um, you should do that. Um, but also, based on this series of talks, the curriculum on collecting, Emily and Lucy are teaching a workshop later this summer for teens um, at the Baltimore Jewelry Center, connecting with nature through jewelry, which is the theme of tonight. Um, it's going to be on Saturday, August 13th from 12 to 6, and students will learn the importance of sourcing and repurposing local materials. Mm. Amazing. Amazing. I wish your kids could all join. I know. <laughs> they can. <laughs> East Coast. Um, anyway, our next panel discussion uh, is 
scheduled for September. We don't have the final date yet, but we'll be keeping you posted on that. The conversation is spaces for collections. So um, it's gonna be exciting and interesting to discuss. So any, um, I just wanna say, Thank you all. Thank you, everyone who listened tonight. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for the panel. The guys are amazing. And um, see you in September. Thank you. Thank you, awesome. everybody. Thanks. Thanks so much. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye. Bye.